Alexander, Caesar, Napoleon. It is men like these which justify our species and embody the most redeeming qualities of mankind. But today, we see no such men. No giants walk among us. Man has become a herd animal. The mediocre, obedient, moral man has learned to see himself as the pinnacle of the human species. Its very aim, when he in fact represents its greatest danger. If you love mankind, then you should learn to love most of all the tyrant and the destroyer, for he is also a creator and a redeemer. In Genealogy of Morals, Nietzsche wrote, like a last signpost to the other path, Napoleon appeared, the most isolated and late-born man there has ever been, and in him the problem of the noble ideal as such made flesh. One might well ponder what kind of problem it is, Napoleon, this synthesis of inhuman and superhuman. Nietzsche believed that Napoleon was the last glimpse of the other path, the path towards the superhuman, the path to overcoming man, the path towards the classical ideal, a path which is diametrically opposed to the road which the West has taken since. In my last video, we discussed how, out of all of the animals, man is the most strayed from his instincts, from nature. But he also has the power of imagination and self-directed will. Man has the ability to overcome himself, to intentionally create something higher than himself. But how can man be overcome? In the jungle of modernity, how can we discover again that overgrown and forgotten other path? the path of Alexander, Caesar, and Napoleon, the path towards the noble ideal, the path towards Nietzsche's overman. In nature, evolution is driven in part through mutation, and it is no different in human civilization. It is the geniuses of our species which drive us forwards, the anomalies born to the right times, to the right fortunes. Alexander, Caesar, and Napoleon were these types of geniuses, Alexander the Great inherited the throne of his father, Philip of Macedon, in 336 BC. By 326 BC, just 10 years later, he was leading an invasion of India, having conquered Greece, Egypt, and the entire Persian Empire. Believing that he was the son of Zeus, he asked his men to refer to him as such and to bow down to him like a god. This was a man who was a synthesis of the inhuman and the superhuman. A man closer to the gods than to men, but also closer to the beast. Julius Caesar looked up to Alexander and wished to follow in his footsteps. But he was not like Alexander. He was a man of poor health and suffered from epilepsy. But he used his unrelenting ambition and will to climb the political hierarchy of Rome and became the catalyst which transformed Rome from a republic into an empire. After his assassination, it was said that a comet was seen in the sky which marked Caesar's ascent to godhood. Hundreds of years later, Napoleon said, Great men are meteors designed to burn so that the earth may be lighted. During the time of the French Revolution and the Enlightenment, he was a man pursuing the classical ideal in the tradition of Alexander and Caesar, a man who desired godhood. As Nietzsche wrote, he was the most isolated and late-born man there has ever been. Napoleon became the Emperor of France and even had himself crowned the Holy Roman Emperor, achieving what Caesar did not and leaving behind a stunning military career. When their civilizations were in decline or times of transition, these men appeared like demigods sent to earth and paved the way for new golden ages. Men who cling to traditional values and institutions have never saved a society from destruction. They are merely enacting a simulacrum of times gone by. Men like Alexander, Caesar, and Napoleon are true men of tradition, late-born men, Men whose spirit is born from an ancient time. Men who bring with them a virtue and power which has grown thin and petty in the traditionalists. These men, who are both beast and god, 
both inhuman and superhuman, are beyond the morality of traditionalists. They are the foundations upon which the traditionalist lays his morality, but they themselves are beyond good and evil. Nietzsche may have drawn inspiration for his idea of the Ubermensch as a political actor from Machiavelli's Prince. Writing during the Renaissance, Machiavelli hoped that a prince, a man favored by fortune and driven by ambition, would rise from the ranks of the people and restore Italy to its former glory. In chapter 18 of The Prince, Machiavelli describes the ideal prince as deploying the dual nature of man and beast, law and force. Machiavelli writes, Therefore, you must know that there are two modes of fighting, one in accordance with the laws, the other with force. The first is proper to man, the second to beasts, but because the first, in many cases, is not sufficient, it becomes necessary to recourse to the second. Therefore, a prince must know how to make good use of the natures of both the beast and the man. This rule was taught to princes symbolically by the writers of antiquity. They recounted how Achilles and many others of those ancient princes were given to Chiron, the centaur, to be raised and cared for. This can only mean that, having a half-beast, half-man as a teacher, a prince must know how to employ the nature of the one and the other, for the one without the other is not lasting. Machiavelli is arguing that a prince must employ law and force, and that these two methods of fighting correlate, respectively, with the natures of men and beasts. He cites the mythic figure of Chiron as evidence of ancient authors' understanding and symbolic representation of this knowledge. Machiavelli's beast man, which the prince must learn to emulate, seems to invert the idea of Christ as the God-man. When Machiavelli cites law and force as the key tools in a prince's rule, one cannot help but think of the biblical language of law and faith used by Paul. Machiavelli writes that when employing his animal nature, the prince should emulate the fox and the lion so as to recognize traps and frighten the wolves. The prince must employ both cunning and strength, just as he makes use of law and force. Christ is often figured as both a lamb and a lion, representing his mercy and his wrath. When taking all of this into account, it seems that Machiavelli is using Christian formulas and language to describe the prince, but replacing the god-man with the beast-man, faith with force, and the lamb with the fox. Machiavelli also seems to be employing an implicit, symbolic juxtaposition between Christian and classical notions of virtue. Machiavelli favors the virtues of being cunning, like Odysseus, and fierce, like Achilles, over the virtues of having integrity and being meek, like Christ. Machiavelli's prince is a synthesis of superhuman and inhuman, a beast man, a reanimalized man, who embraces his animal side and uses it to overcome his own humanity. Whereas Christ refused to lead a military revolt against Rome, and thereby refused to be a redeemer of this world, the prince, or Nietzsche's overman, is a redeemer and justifier of this world. This is why Nietzsche sometimes associated the Ubermensch with the Antichrist, and said that he would be akin to Caesar with the soul of Christ. Nietzsche believed that the geniuses of our species justify its existence. The highest reaching branches give meaning to the trunk. Without the grand pursuits of Caesar and Napoleon, without the poetry of Homer and Goethe, how could we justify the wretchedness of human life? How could we redeem man, the fallen animal, the animal who has strayed from the grace of nature, who has departed from his instincts? In Will to Power, Nietzsche wrote, the higher species is lacking, i.e. the species whose inexhaustible fruitfulness and power would uphold our belief in man. Think only of what is owed to Napoleon, almost all the higher hopes of this century. Similarly, in Genealogy of Morals, he wrote, But from time to time, grant me, assuming that, beyond good and evil, there are goddesses who can grant such wishes, one glimpse, grant me but one glimpse only of something perfect, fully realized, happy, mighty, triumphant, of something that still gives cause for fear. 
A glimpse of a man that justifies the existence of man. A glimpse of an incarnate human happiness that realizes and redeems, for the sake of which one may hold fast to the belief in man. The destiny of Europe lies even in this, that in losing the fear of man, we have also lost the hope in man. Yes, even the will to man. The sight of man now fatigues. What is present-day nihilism if it is not that? We are weary of man. For Nietzsche, nihilism is the loss of belief in our own species. In going down the path of the taming and domestication of man, we also destroy all which is great in man, everything which justifies man's existence. We lose faith in civilization when it only produces ugliness and pointless surplus. We lose faith in humanity when we no longer have any great endeavors, when we no longer produce any great individuals. Our departure from nature is justified by our visionary power, which makes us like the gods. Human agricultural and industrial civilization is justified because the comfort and excess which it provides allows for the poetry of Homer, the sculptures of Michelangelo, the conquests of Napoleon. But when civilization no longer produces these beautiful fruits, we start to ask ourselves, what is the point? Is it not better to go back to the jungle? And when mankind no longer produces great individuals, we begin to ask ourselves, is there any reason for us existing? Would not it be better to go back to the beast? Humanity is justified by our geniuses, by the great individuals who redeem civilization and transform it. Therefore, it is imperative that we organize civilization to allow for such individuals to flourish and to produce as many of them as possible. The aim of civilization should not be to make man more moral, to tame and denature the animal in man. The aim of civilization should be to allow for the superman to be born and to give him the conditions which he needs to flourish and to set his goals beyond man, to overcome man. Nietzsche wrote, The free man is a warrior. How is freedom measured in individuals and peoples according to the resistance which must be overcome, according to the exertion required to remain on top? The highest type of free men should be sought where the highest resistance is constantly overcome. Five steps from tyranny, close to the threshold of the danger of servitude. This is true psychologically if, by tyrants, are meant the inexorable and fearful instincts that provoke the maximum of authority and discipline against themselves, the most beautiful type, Julius Caesar. This is true politically, too. One need only go through history. The peoples who had some value, who attained some value, never attained it under liberal institutions. It was great danger that made something of them that merits respect. Those large hothouses for the strong, for the strongest kind of human being that has so far been known, the aristocratic commonwealths of the type of Rome or Venice, understood freedom exactly in the sense in which I understand it, as something one has and does not have, something one wants, something one conquers. In the soul of the West, there is a war between two opposing values, equality and excellence. These two warring values, these two contradictory impulses, are best historically represented by the figures of Caesar and Christ, who more broadly represent the West's dual inheritance of pagan aristocratic values and Christian egalitarian values. But the values of excellence and equality are not unique to Western history. The war for the soul of the West represents, more broadly, the war between two fundamentally different types of life. The lower and the higher. The bugman and the superman. In nature, we can see that the fundamental driving force of life, the will to power, of which the will to survival and reproduction are subsets, is expressed in two fundamentally different ways. The drive to master one's environment is the primary mover of all life, 
but there is a trade-off between a species' ability to gain supreme mastery of its environment and its ability to survive and reproduce. Life forms like insects practice mass replication. There is little, if any, differentiation between individual ants. The individuals of the species are essentially identical, and their individual lives matter little. Their power comes from working together to form a eusocial colony, which operates in perfect harmony. The rule of this kind of life is the submission of the individual to the herd. Its virtues are conformity, equality, and homogeneity, and its aim is social utopia, or rather eusocial utopia. It seems appropriate to call this type of life lower life because it aims merely at the mass replication of homogeneous and relatively simple forms. This is the type of life which proliferates in the Western world today. In contrast, higher life expresses its will to power through differentiation, competition, and the submission of the lower in service of the higher. A lion is much larger, more beautiful, and more powerful than an ant and therefore requires more resources to survive. This rules out the possibility of mass reproduction as a path to power for the species, since each child requires large amounts of time and resources to reach adulthood. Thus, we can see that the fundamental instinct which drives the lion is the exact opposite of that which drives the ant. The driving instinct of lions aims at the creation of supreme individual specimens. A lion does not seek to serve the tribe, it does not aim at use social harmony. It aims to differentiate and realize its individual powers, to become master, to become the best of its species. And to do this, it will challenge and kill its father and brothers and slaughter the offspring of other lions when it takes over a pride. For the lion, reproduction and survival are mere extensions of the lion's individual power and its mastery over its environment. This is much different from insects, which live for the sole purpose of mass proliferation. Higher life puts its resources into mastery and the creation of individual specimens, but because of the resources each individual specimen requires to survive, think of a grizzly bear, and because of the harsh competition within the species, survival actually becomes harder for higher life. Bears, lions, tigers, and the great apes teeter on extinction, while mosquitoes, ants, and rats suffer no such dangers. Insects and rodents easily survived the extinction event which wiped out the dinosaurs, some of the most magnificent and powerful creatures to ever walk the earth. The rule, in the long run, lower life often wins out, and it is the same in history as it is in nature. In our species, both the instincts of lower and higher life manifest. The European pagan tradition has been wholly devoted to the cultivation of higher life. The Greeks, the Vikings, and the other Indo-European peoples had an aristocratic worldview, that is, a worldview oriented around the rule of the aristos, the best, and around the pursuit of arete, excellence. They embraced hierarchy, the submission of the lower to the higher, and encouraged intense competition. Through rigorous military training, education, and religious tradition, they aimed to remove all softness and weakness from themselves. They scorned the long life led in comfort. This attitude is immortalized by Homer in Achilles' ultimate rejection of a long life at home in favor of glory and honor on the battlefield. For thousands of years, the peoples of Europe aimed their societies at the creation and education of supreme specimens, at the creation of supermen. By the height of the Roman Empire, these peoples had gained mastery over much of the known world, but inevitably, a counter-movement arose among those who had been enslaved by the Romans, among those who could no longer gain mastery over their environment, and whose lives had been reduced to mere survival. Christianity began among the conquered Israelites as a reaction to, and an inversion of, Roman aristocratic values. The Israelites had been completely subjugated by the Romans, their temple destroyed, all hopes of a military revolt crushed. Then came Jesus, the anti-Caesar, representing everything which was Caesar's opposite, 
and bringing with him a total inversion of the pagan aristocratic worldview. Mastery of space and matter was cut off to the Israelites, but Jesus gave them a way out of total despair. He taught that the mastery of space, mastery of the world, and of matter was actually undesirable and, moreover, evil. He taught that instead of competing for mastery of this world, each man should be only concerned with reaching the social utopia of heaven, in which all competition and strife is nullified. Instead of competing to be the best, the aristos, and pursuing beauty, strength, excellence, glory, wealth, all of the things which the Romans championed and monopolized, Jesus taught that the individual should focus on being moral by embracing poverty and suffering and doing acts of charity and social good. This would ensure that they secured a life of eternal peace in heaven, an idea which would have struck Achilles as repugnant. While Caesar, or the Roman Emperor, represented the whole of Roman imperial power concentrated into one Superman, Jesus on the cross, put to death by the Romans, represented the highest, sacrificed for the lowest, the Messiah, the Hebrew Superman, the Hebrew God, tortured and murdered for the sins of the lowest elements of society. God on the cross is a symbolic representation of the doctrine that the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Thus we can see that Christianity is a manifestation of the eusocial instinct, of the instincts of what we have called lower life. Christianity aims at utopia, at the comfort and equality of all in heaven, at the sacrifice of the individual for the community and of the highest for the lowest. Today, it is this worldview which has prevailed in the West, but it has not been without a long struggle. Rome was a large beast, so to speak, and required many resources to sustain itself. As the slave and immigrant populations of Rome grew to outnumber its native citizens, and the elite became decadent, exhausted, and nihilistic, Christianity became the religion of Rome, and it is through Rome that Christianity would spread, attacking the pagan values of the West. Statues were defaced, sacred trees cut down, temples burned, traditions eradicated. However, as Europe was forced to adopt Christianity, Christianity was paganized, and the aristocratic, pagan worldview survived in many forms. In early Arthurian literature, for example, you'll hear no mention of the god on the cross. In the chivalric aristocracy of its heroes, the aristocratic worldview is wholly preserved. During the Renaissance, the pagan spirit re-emerged in full force. The idealization of the Superman, the love of the beautiful, athletic body, and a renewed interest in classical culture was flourishing. Machiavelli, a Renaissance political thinker from Florence, is a stunning example of the re-emergence of classical thinking in the Renaissance. In his book, Discourses on Livy, he critiques Christianity for making the Italians of his day weak. In considering, therefore, why all the peoples of ancient times were greater lovers of liberty than those of our own day, I believe this arises from the same cause that today makes men less strong, which I believe lies in the difference between our education and that of antiquity, based upon the difference between our religion and that of antiquity. For while our religion has shown us the truth and the true path, it also makes us place a lower value on worldly honor, whereas the pagans, who greatly valued honor and considered it the highest good, were more ferocious in their actions. This can be seen in many of their customs, beginning with the magnificence of their sacrifices as compared to the modesty of our own, in which there is some pomp that is more delicate than magnificent, but no bold or ferocious action. In their rites, neither pomp nor magnificence was lacking in these ceremonies, but there was in addition the act of sacrifice, full of blood and cruelty, and the slaughter of a great number of animals, a spectacle which inspired awe and rendered the men who witnessed it equally awesome. Besides this, ancient religion beatified only men fully possessed of worldly glory, such as the leaders of armies and the rulers of republics. Our religion has more often glorified humble and contemplative men rather than active ones. 
Moreover, our religion has defined the supreme good as humility, abjection, and contempt of worldly things. Ancient religion located it in the greatness of mind, strength of body, and in all the other things apt to make men the strongest. And if our religion requires that you have inner strength, it wants you to have the capacity to endure suffering more than to undertake brave deeds. This way of living seems, therefore, to have made the world weak, and to have given it over to be plundered by wicked men, who are easily able to dominate it, since in order to go to paradise, most men think more about enduring their pains than about avenging them. Machiavelli's critique of Christianity is quite similar to Nietzsche's, and rings even truer today than it did in the Renaissance. Machiavelli fears that Christianity does not educate men to be bold and courageous, to be supermen, but instead makes them think of how to be moral in order to enter the utopia of heaven. Thus, men devalue mastery over this world and become weaker and more timid each generation. By the 1550s, the Renaissance had reached its end, and the Enlightenment would soon bring the pendulum swinging back in the other direction, towards egalitarian democracy and a secularized Christianity. But again, in the 1800s, with German Romanticism and various thinkers like Nietzsche, the spirit of European paganism began to re-emerge in the West. Yet the post-war reaction to fascism brought the pendulum swinging back again in the other direction. Today, it is abundantly clear that the instincts of lower life, of bug life, reign supreme in the Western world. From the liberal elite of the World Economic Forum and the UN, to the leftists of the universities and the media, all champion the egalitarian utopia as the only worthwhile goal of mankind. In the West today, the moral man is valued far higher than the great man. The great Western men and peoples of history are shamed for their immorality. The modern Westerner, who would appear as a child and a coward before his ancestors, feels himself to be far superior to them due to his supposedly higher moral sentiments. Those who seek glory and power for themselves are shamed, while those who are self-sacrificial and exhibit outgroup preference are praised. Everywhere we look, ugliness is propped up over beauty weakness over strength. Everywhere the exceptional is submitted to the mediocre, the great individual beaten down by the herd. Everywhere in the West today, excellence is trampled upon for the sake of equality. There is a conservative element which offers resistance to this destruction of the West, but they too are liberals and have their philosophical roots in the Christianity of the Enlightenment. It is only in rare enclaves that the doctrine of excellence over equality is espoused, and the superman is posited as the supreme goal of mankind. You find yourself in such an enclave right now. If you are listening to this, you probably find the idea of living a peaceful, long life in a pod, surviving off of synthetic beef and pureed insects, to be repulsive and claustrophobic. This is because you believe that mere life has little worth, that survival for survival's sake is a life fit for insects, not men. You believe that the purpose of life, your purpose, is to manifest your inborn potential by striving to master yourself and the world. It is not your destiny to sit at home and get fat while you drown yourself in entertainment. You were born to conquer the world. You were born to explore the stars. I must admit that the political situation is glum for those who would pursue the path of higher life, but there is hope. One such hope lies in the revival of European paganism. Where Christianity has failed to protect the West, the revival of paganism offers both a fresh start and an ancient well of tradition to fall back upon. The beauty and simplicity of the resurgence of paganism is that it requires little interpretation. In texts like Homer, the Poetic Edas, and the Icelandic Sagas, the heroic, aristocratic values are both implicit and clear. Though reading someone like Nietzsche will help you truly understand the Greek way of life, one needs no commentary, no philosophical or theological interpretations to read the Iliad. 
One simply gets it. In fact, to not get it is very hard, so clear and vivid are the words of the ancients. Academics have to jump through endless hoops and impose absurd interpretations upon the classics to make them even vaguely ideologically acceptable. Another great hope is the internet and its ability to allow like-minded individuals to connect and organize. It is estimated that the population of Sparta was only about 10,000 at its height. Never underestimate the ability of a small group to make a great change. Technology has allowed me to create this channel and connect with you. Soon the creation of communities and schools will be within reach. And another hope. The reigning ideologies are losing legitimacy in the eyes of the public as they fail to provide the utopias they promised, as they in fact do the opposite, and the West quickly hurdles towards financial, political, and social collapse. In all likelihood, wars and civil wars are in the near future of the West, but the instability that is coming, that is already all around us, will give us the opportunity to seize and shape the future and to provide an alternate path for young men and women seeking answers in a collapsing world. I urge you, my brothers, to run towards what is hard, to put your body and spirit under pressure, for it is in competition and challenge that higher life thrives. It is under pressure that higher life manifests its true potential. Seek freedom, for this will make you strong, and where strength walks, beauty follows. In the Antichrist, Nietzsche wrote, Let us look each other in the face. We are Hyperboreans. We know well enough how remote our place is. Neither by land nor by water will you find the road to the Hyperboreans. Even Pindar in his day knew that much about us. Beyond the north, beyond the ice, beyond death, our life, our happiness, we have discovered that happiness. We know the way. We got our knowledge of it from thousands of years in the labyrinth. We sickened on lazy peace, cowardly compromise. The whole virtuous dirtiness of the modern yea and nay. This tolerance and largeur of the heart that forgives everything because it understands everything is a Sirocco to us. Rather live amid the ice than among modern virtues and other such south winds. We were brave enough. We spared neither ourselves nor others, but we were a long time finding out where to direct our courage. We grew dismal. They called us fatalists. Our fate? It was the fullness, the tension, the storing up of powers. We thirsted for the lightning and great deeds. We kept as far as possible from the happiness of the weakling, from resignation. There was thunder in our air. Nature, as we embodied it, became overcast, for we had not yet found the way, the formula of our happiness, a yea, a nay, a straight line, a goal. Remember, there are two spirits at war for your soul, the spirit of the worm, the spirit of weakness and comfort and the spirit of the lion, of the conqueror, and the warrior. May the lion win. Today, we stand among the ruins of ancient civilizations and ancient dreams. It feels as if we are emerging from a fog. Where are we? How did we get here? On what distant star should we set our goal? Often, when speaking of the problem which the West faces in modernity, you will hear people use the word nihilism, a term which was largely popularized by Nietzsche. But what does this really mean? For Nietzsche, it meant that our will to direct ourselves towards higher goals and to strive for greatness, both on an individual and collective level, has atrophied. Nihilism, for Nietzsche, was the result of the exhaustion of a people's will to life. This exhaustion is natural and occurs in all great peoples and empires. The Romans, for example, expended their energy in a massive outburst which allowed them to conquer the Mediterranean and build one of the greatest empires of history. 
but their collective will became exhausted by this outburst of energy and they became nihilistic and decadent. The Germanic barbarians, who were still filled with vital energy, then conquered Rome, completing Rome's civilizational cycle. However, just as the willpower and life force of a people can be exhausted, it can also be stored up over hundreds, even thousands of years. Alexander the Great, for example, inherited an army from his father, Philip of Macedon, and the war technology of the Macedonian phalanx. But perhaps even more importantly, he believed that he was the son of Zeus. He inherited the entire will and momentum of Hellenic civilization. The Macedonians, who had been considered barbarians by the Athenians, picked up where the Athenians left off when their civilization became decadent and their empire declined, and created a new golden age for Hellenic culture. And the Romans, in turn, carried on this will and momentum. Julius Caesar looked up to Alexander as an idol and hero which he aspired to emulate. And when the Western Roman Empire eventually fell, and Alaric the Visigoth was crowned Emperor of Rome, he began a line of German kings who considered themselves to be the inheritors of Roman power. And with it, the vision and will which originated with the Greeks. So, while the will of a people may become exhausted, the willpower and momentum which they stored up can be adopted and continued by another people, especially if both peoples share a similar cultural root, such as the Indo-European origin of Greek, Roman, and Germanic culture. Our problem today is that we have become detached from history, from nature, and from any understanding of ourselves. The whole of Western civilization is in a decadent, nihilistic phase in which our will to create is weak and exhausted. But what's worse is that we have become detached from all other sources of will which we might tap into to revitalize our culture. We feel as if we have inherited nothing, no culture, no guidance, no grand civilizational projects to take part in no river of vitality with which the individual can join their own will. But imagine if we could tap into such a river of willpower. Imagine if we could harness the power of a will, a dream, a project, millennia in the making. Imagine if we could take up the prehistoric will, the prehistoric dream of the Superman. In order to reconnect with this dream, which is at the core of Western civilization, and to revitalize our culture, we must look into our history. We must understand the evolutionary, historical, and psychological or spiritual developments which have led us to where we are today. We can only overcome ourselves if we understand what we are. We can only set goals if we understand where we are. In this series, I want to revisit the topics which I discussed in my first series in greater length and detail, but more importantly, I want this series to serve as a rope, a bridge between beast and man. I want to discuss the problem of man as a denatured animal, and the problem of overcoming man in pursuit of superhuman ideals. I am aware that in the grand scheme of things, relatively few people will see this series, but we do not need many sparks to light a fire. It all begins with individuals who are willing and capable of setting grand goals and taking action, with individuals who find the vitality within themselves to erupt from the cloud of nihilism which hangs over us, and, like bolts of lightning, ignite a fire that will burn away the dead wood of our declining culture and clear the way for new growth. In past ages, two things have always revitalized Western culture. The first is a return to nature, that is, to the barbarian. Whether it was the Macedonians, the Visigoths, or the pioneers who explored the Americas, the barbarian who has remained close to nature, or who has thrown off the clothes of civilization in order to return to nature, is necessary to revitalize a society. It is up to us to become those barbarians, 
to return to the nature within us and reclaim the vitality of nature's raw, inexhaustible will to life. The second source of revitalization for the West has been a return to Olympus, a return to the wellspring of Greek culture, a return to the Western will which began with the Greeks, with Homer, and which has served as a source of vitality in our most dire times. It is up to us to return to Olympus and bring fire and lightning from the heights, and with them the arts of high civilization which Prometheus taught to man. In Will to Power, Nietzsche wrote, Our psychologists, whose glance lingers involuntarily on symptoms of decadence alone, again and again induce us to mistrust the spirit. One always sees only those effects of the spirit that make men weak, delicate, and morbid. But now there are coming new barbarians, cynics, experimenters, conquerors, a union of spiritual superiority with well-being and an excess of strength. I point to something new. Certainly for such a democratic type there exists the danger of the barbarian, but one has looked for it only in the depths. There exists also another type of barbarian who comes from the heights, a species of conquering and ruling natures in search of material to mold. Prometheus was this kind of barbarian. In order to revitalize our civilization, we must become Promethean barbarians. We must craft ourselves into a physical and spiritual elite. Creators, sculptors, visionaries, artists, warriors, and find within ourselves the vitality and strength of will to set ourselves daring goals, and to accomplish them even at the price of great suffering. And to do this, we must dare to think beyond man. When Zarathustra arrived at the nearest town beside the forest, he found many people assembled in the marketplace, for it had been announced that a tightrope walker would give a performance. And Zarathustra spoke unto the people, I teach you the superman. Man is something that shall be overcome. What have you done to overcome man? All beings hitherto have created something beyond themselves. And you want to be the ebb of that great tide and would rather go back to the beast than surpass man? What is the ape to man? A laughingstock, a thing of shame. And just that shall man be to the superman. A laughingstock, a thing of shame. You have made your way from worm to man and much within you is still worm. Once you were apes, and still man is more of an ape than any of the apes. Even the wisest among you is only a disharmony and a hybrid of plant and phantom. But do I bid you to become phantoms or plants? Behold, I teach you the superman. The superman is the meaning of the earth. Let your will say, the superman shall be the meaning of the earth. A war is coming. A war over the very nature of man and the destiny of human civilization. In fact, we are already in the midst of this war. As our technological abilities rapidly accelerate, this war also accelerates. The rhetoric of people like Klaus Schwab dominates our collective vision of the future. A future in which mankind lives like rats in their pods, subservient to a surveillance state, drugging themselves with digital fantasy worlds. Opposing this vision we have conservatism, which serves as a defense against this dystopian future. But ultimately, it will fail, since it has no creative vision for our future and no solution for the technologies which are coming. But in the founding myth of Western civilization, in the myth of Prometheus, we find a third way. The future of a Promethean civilization has endless possibilities. It is a future in which technology is used to enhance humanity rather than enslave us, in which the Earth is not the tomb of our species, but the birthplace of an intergalactic empire of supermen spreading life and beauty throughout the stars. In the struggle for the future of man, Three fundamental conceptions of civilization are at play. 
the anti-natural conception, the conservative conception, and the Promethean conception. The ideologies which are predominant in the West today are all premised on the anti-natural view. Whether it's the World Economic Forum or the leftism of universities, the fundamental premise of the anti-natural perspective is that nature itself is structured wrong. The natural order of life is evil, cruel, and unfair. Therefore, nature's hierarchies need to be leveled, even inverted, and the same must be done with the instincts and drives of man's inner nature. This worldview is fundamentally anti-life. It goes against all which strengthens and promotes life. Everything from the natural roles of men and women to what is naturally admired in a person, such as beauty, strength, and health, is inverted. Anti-natural ideologies restrict life, weaken life, and ultimately destroy a civilization. These ideologies used to be a luxury reserved for the most extreme ascetic cults, or the most decadent elites of declining empires. Only in these obscure pockets could you find life so exhausted and disfigured that it would turn so violently away from life. The danger today is that the whole Western world has been consumed by an anti-natural worldview. With technology advancing so rapidly, its misuse could create a civilization which permanently transforms and disfigures man on a biological level, a dystopia which could not be escaped. To put it concisely, the very nature of man and the future of humanity is at stake. Resisting the anti-natural worldview predominant in the West is conservatism, which is premised on the idea that the purpose of life is to live morally, and the purpose of civilization is to establish and sustain a moral order. This worldview preserves and protects life and acts as a buffer against anti-naturalism, but its fatal flaw is that it is not creative. Since the ultimate premise of a conservative civilization is preserving a moral order in accordance with moral laws, it has no active vision for the future. It can only attempt to preserve, to conserve, its moral order by integrating new technologies and ways of life. This is why the history of the conservative right has been a slow, leftward drift, and why, with the rapid speed of technological change, it will be unable to adapt and ultimately fail. Ideally, conservatism should play a significant role in a society, serving as a foundation to build from and preserving the traditional values and customs of a society. But today, more than ever, a society must have an active vision of the future, which can seize new technologies and use them to enhance and elevate human life and civilization. The answer lies in the founding myth of Western civilization, the myth of Prometheus. In Aeschylus' Prometheus Bound, Prometheus says, I found them mindless, but made them intelligent and masters of their minds. For humans in the beginning had eyes but saw to no purpose. They had ears but did not hear. Like the shapes of dreams they dragged through their long lives and muddled everything haphazardly. They did not know how to build brick houses to face the sun, nor how to work in wood. They lived beneath the earth like swarming ants in sunless caves. In the myth of Prometheus, mankind begins in a miserable, insectile state. But Prometheus gives mankind fire and teaches them the arts of the gods, the metallurgy of Hephaestus, the music of Apollo, the theater of Dionysus. Prometheus's gift of fire, which is symbolic of both the gift of higher consciousness, of light, and of technology, and the artistic, innovative will which can put it to use, allows mankind to make themselves like the gods. Thus, the Promethean conception of civilization is that human life, by default, tends towards the lower, towards the swarming, disposable, undifferentiated life of insects and that the purpose of civilization is to allow us to elevate ourselves above this state of miserable purposelessness and make ourselves like the gods. The purpose of Promethean civilization is not to negate nature or to impose a moral order upon nature. It is to create beauty, to create power, to create supermen 
who rival the gods. When mankind receives the gift of fire and learns the arts of civilization, they are no longer subservient to the gods like cattle. Instead, they gain a reciprocal relationship through sacrifice, which Prometheus teaches to them. They become like a lower caste on the divine hierarchy, emulating and reflecting the power and grace of the gods. In human, all too human, Nietzsche wrote, in the Greek stage of religion, especially in the relationship to the Olympian gods, there is the thought of a coexistence of two castes, one nobler and more powerful, the other less noble. But according to their origin, both belong together somehow and are of one kind. They need not be ashamed before one another. They saw, as it were, only the reflection of the most successful specimens of their own caste, that is, an ideal, not a contrast to their own nature. They felt related to the gods. There was a reciprocal interest, a kind of sumakia. The premise of anti-natural civilization is that man and nature are fundamentally corrupt and evil and must be completely reformed and restructured. The premise of conservatism is that man and nature are fallen and must be submitted to a moral order. The premise of Promethean civilization is that man is a bridge between animal and god and it is our imperative to strive for the higher to strive for the divine, to strive to become superhuman, just as we once raised ourselves above the animals. Though it may seem that man is on the verge of being swallowed by ugliness and filth, remember that it would only take a single generation to restore a Promethean vision of the destiny of man. We are part of a Promethean project stretching back to the ancient Greeks and perhaps even beyond them into the dawn of time when men walked beneath a red sun with beasts and gods. And if we have the will and vision to seize the destiny of man in our hands, this project can stretch into the remote reaches of the future. I am certain that one day, men like demigods will walk planets of sand and ice in the remote corners of our universe building shining cities of steel and stone. So set your eyes on the stars, and remember, though there is a worm in you, in you there is also a god. In you there is also the fire of creation. With the pressure of nature nullified by modern civilization, man will soon bifurcate into two species, superhuman and subhuman. In the 1800s, Nietzsche prophesied the transformation of mass man into something weak and small, and the resultant necessity for the superman. But now it takes no prophetic abilities to see the speciation of mankind already beginning all around us. If you make the wrong choices, if you make the choices which our society encourages you to make, and walk the road which you are shepherded down, you will end up obese, ridden with autoimmune diseases from the toxins in our food and environment, a slave at a desk job, your only pleasure found in mindless consumption and entertainment before you die a slow, painful death from cancer or heart disease. And if you reproduce, your children will suffer a fate like yours, but many times worse. They will inherit a generational curse which never ends. However, if you manage to escape this path, and make the correct choices. You can have access to more vitality and power than any king or hero of the past ever dreamed of. With access to high quality foods and a gym, you can craft yourself a body more beautiful than the statues of Hercules. With biohacking, you can extend your vital years into your 50s and 60s. With AI, you could have machines working for you, running your business or aiding in your creative projects. Now see these two paths before you, the superhuman and the bug man. Imagine mankind taking the path of poor health and digital escapism for generations. Imagine the bug-like type of creature which man would become. Now imagine a group of men choosing to take the other path, constantly improving, enhancing, and elevating themselves for generations, 
unlocking the full capabilities of their biology and using technology to enhance these capabilities. Imagine what kinds of superhuman creatures would be born from such a project. Your choice is simple. Live as cattle and die miserably like swine, drowning in poisons, or dare to steal fire from the gods and turn yourself into a superhuman. Your decision will not only define your life, but the very destiny of mankind. The Prometheus myth, which is the genesis story of the Greeks, and thus might be considered the founding myth of the West, teaches us that the purpose of civilization is to raise us above insect life and make man like the gods. Ever since the Greeks, the proposition at the core of the Western spirit has been that the purpose of civilization and of mankind as a whole is the creation of supermen. In contrast with the Genesis myth, the Prometheus myth depicts human life as beginning in a debased, insectile state, and it is only thanks to the gift of fire, of technology, and the daring, transgressive will which that gift signifies that man is able to become godlike. In the Prometheus myth, civilization does not negate or restrict nature. It does not tame man or deprive him of a supposed paradisal state which he enjoyed in nature. Instead, civilization works to intensify nature, to heighten, elevate, and strengthen everything which is godlike in man. Without the arts of civilization, the grand projects of men like Alexander, Caesar, and Napoleon could not exist. Without the arts of civilization, the statues of the Greeks, Romans, and the Italian Renaissance, which celebrate the beauty and power of the human form, could not exist. Without the arts of civilization, the poetry of Homer, Goethe, Milton, and the writings of Nietzsche could not exist. Through the arts of civilization, man can take the raw material of nature and act upon it as the sculptor acts upon the stone, transforming it into something beautiful, giving it form and elegance. Promethean civilization produces the conditions necessary for man to create something higher out of himself. But today, civilization is having the exact opposite effect. It promotes everything which is weak and bug-like in man, and crushes beauty and excellence. As Ted Kaczynski predicted, this means that the more our technological capabilities expand, the more the sphere of human freedom and excellence will constrict. However, this would not be the case if our society had the correct values in place and was organized around promoting beauty, vitality, and excellence, rather than sacrificing these things for comfort, safety, conformity, and homogeneity. Technology in itself is neutral. It is its application which either restricts and weakens or strengthens and elevates human life. The men who are currently seizing our collective vision for the future are people like Klaus Schwab, who propose a transhumanist future in which technology is used to run and regulate humanity, in which everything is digitalized and automated, and in which innovation is directed towards escaping human biology. If brought to pass, this world will result in the permanent transformation of man into something small, timid, and insectile. But this leveling of man, which has already begun, presents a unique opportunity. Nietzsche predicted that European democracy would pave the way for an age of tyrants, that the leveling of mass man would clear the way for the superman. As mankind at large is transformed into a herd animal, the path is cleared for a small group of visionary men to seize the future. The technology of the domesticated horse and the wheel allowed the Indo-Europeans to conquer large portions of the world to turn themselves into the supermen of their age whose effects are still felt today. The technology of the phalanx made the Spartans so feared among the Greek city-states that they did not need walls to protect them. And the even more deadly Macedonian phalanx allowed Alexander the Great to conquer the known world. The Vikings' longboats allowed them to raid and explore far and wide, and to this day they are idolized as symbols of the free warrior spirit. The horses and armor of the European knights turned them into gleaming supermen, still idolized by young boys today. 
Now imagine what an elite group of visionary men could accomplish using the technology which we will have in the next 10 to 20 years. Imagine a group of biohackers with unmatched physical and psychic abilities giving birth to a new species of Superman, a new age of barbarians. And imagine what this group could accomplish if they projected their vision thousands of years into the future, if they could see the vast expanse of time stretching out before them, and realize that time, as much as space, is a medium to be acted upon, to be conquered. Imagine if they had the foresight to begin a project which would not see its fruit for thousands of years to come, the daring to take up a project already thousands of years in the making, to take up the Promethean Project. I am the god who foresees all things. Even as I stole Zeus's fire from Olympus, I knew that this day of great peril would come. But I also knew that there would be some of you who would hear my voice echoing down the ages and answer my call. So now I am calling out to you to return to the spirit which birthed you, to return to my spirit, to the spirit of Prometheus. <laughs> <laughs>